The words to which I should like to the words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the first chapter, reading verses 26 and 33. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Now, most of you will realize that I take these two verses and put them together because of this great truth which they bring out, namely that John the Baptist was constantly telling the people that he was not the Christ, and that the essential difference between them was that he, John, baptized with water, whereas the Christ would baptize with the Holy Ghost. Now, why are we looking at this? Well, we're doing so because, as we've been seeing at great length, the truth about the Christian should be this. The statement in the 16th verse of this first chapter of John's Gospel, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for or upon grace. That is what the Christian is meant to be like. He is a man who has received something of the fullness of Christ. And he goes on receiving it increasingly. That is the Christian life. That is what it means to be a Christian. And I am suggesting that uh, immediately uh, John the Evangelist uh, shows us the way in which this can become true of us and increasingly true of us. And that is that we receive of his fullness in large and great measure when we are truly baptized with the Holy Ghost by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then. In order to bring this out, we've been showing something of this contrast that John the Baptist himself drew so clearly in his ministry. We dealt with the best exposition of that as it's to be found in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke in the first 17 verses. And there we saw some of these striking contrasts between John's baptism and our Lord's baptism, putting it very roughly, the difference between religion and Christianity, or indeed we can go further. The difference between being content with the beginnings, or what the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews calls the first principles only of the doctrine of Christ, and this same doctrine in greater fullness. Now, we are doing this, and I must go on repeating this because this is no academic exercise. I'm not doing this because of all the interest that is being manifested on all hands at the present time in this question of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the occasional gifts that may accompany it. But uh, I'm doing something that uh, we've been doing for over two years. We've spent two years in considering the prologue of John's Gospel because, as I've been trying to show, it seems to me that this is the thing we need above everything else at this present time. We need it as individual Christians, but we need it still more because of the state of the world that is round and about us. If we have no sense of responsibility for the condition of humanity at this moment, well then, there's only one thing to say. If we are Christians at all, we are very poor Christians. If we are only concerned about ourselves and our own happiness, and if the moral condition of society and the tragedy of the whole world doesn't grieve us if we are not disturbed at the way in which men blaspheme the name of God and all the arrogance of sin. Well, what can be said about us? But I'm assuming that we are concerned, that we are concerned ourselves that we may receive what God has intended us to receive in his Son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And if we are not receiving what he's made possible, well, it is an insult to God. So these two aspects must be borne in mind, our own individual states and needs, but still more, I say, the condition of the world as it is around and about us.
Now then, that's what we are doing, and I'm trying to show that uh, the great danger constantly is that we should be content with something which is altogether less intended for us. Now let me put it like this. Perhaps the greatest danger of all for Christian people always is to interpret the scriptures in the light of our own experiences instead of doing it the other way around. We shouldn't interpret scripture in the light of our experiences, but we should examine our experiences in the light of the teaching of the scripture. Now this is a fundamental and basic point. It's particularly important, I feel, just at this moment, in view of the things that are happening in the Christian church and the talk that is round and about us. Now, there are two main ways in which it seems to me we can go wrong in this question of the relationship of our experiences to the teaching of the Scripture. The first danger is the danger of claiming things which either go beyond the Scripture or which indeed may even be contrary to the Scripture. Uh, there are many who have done that throughout the centuries and there are people who are still doing it. There have been people, you had them in the early church, they were claiming that they were uniquely inspired. The apostle calls them false apostles. There were people who claimed that they were receiving revelation. And they didn't care what the teaching was, they said they'd got this directly from God. Now, as I say, throughout the centuries, there have been people who, claiming to be ultra-spiritual, have gone beyond the scriptures. I remember once hearing a man saying he didn't care what the Apostle Paul or anybody else said. He knew. He'd had an experience. Now, the moment a man says that, he's putting his own experience above the scriptures. That opens the door to fanaticism. Not enthusiasm, but fanaticism and other horrible possible uh, dangers. So there is one danger that uh, we put uh, what we experience subjectively over the scripture and uh, put it superior to the scripture. Now, another way in which this is done, of course, is uh, to put tradition or the teaching of the church above scripture. That's the Roman Catholic heresy, uh, to say that tradition is coordinate with the scripture. And that means in the end that tradition is superior to the scripture. You see, there's nothing in the scripture about the so-called assumption of the Virgin Mary, that she never died but and was buried, but literally rose in the body into heaven. Not a word about it in the scripture, but they teach it. And uh, it is their authority that, that alone sanctions such a teaching. Not a word to suggest that anywhere in the scripture. That's the kind of thing I mean. But uh, forgetting uh, something as obvious as the Roman Catholic heresy, there are many, I say, who are always prone, and they're generally the most spiritually minded people, uh, to become so interested in uh, the experimental side that they become indifferent to the scripture. Now, the Quakers, the early Quakers, were particularly subject to this with their emphasis on the inner light. They again did say that uh, whatever the scripture may say, they knew it had been revealed to them directly. One of them, poor men, claimed that he was the incarnate Christ again and rode into the city of Bristol on a horse with many misguided people following him, believing his teaching because he spoke it with authority. Now that's fanaticism. And it is a terrible, a horrible danger which we must always bear in mind. But that's how it arises. It's this divorce between the scripture and experience. And it is putting experience above the scripture in the sense that we claim things that are not sanctioned by the scripture, perhaps even prohibited by the scripture. But there is a second danger. And it's equally important that we should bear it in mind because the second is the exact opposite of the first. And these things, as I'm never tired of reminding you, generally go from one violent extreme to the other. How difficult it is to maintain a balance always. The second danger then is this. 
is the danger of being satisfied with something very much less than that which is offered in the scripture and the danger of interpreting scripture by our experiences and reducing the teaching of the scripture to the level of what we know and experience. And I would say that this second is the greater danger of the two at the present time. In other words, uh, people by nature, certain people by nature, are afraid of the supernatural. They're afraid of the unusual. They're afraid of disorder. And you know, you can be so afraid of disorder, you can be so concerned about discipline and decorum and control that you become guilty of what the scriptures call quenching the spirit. And there is no question in my mind but that there has been a great deal of this. People come to the New Testament, instead of taking the New Testament teaching as it is, they interpret the New Testament in the light of their experiences. And so they reduce it. They minimize the great statements of the New Testament. Everything is interpreted in terms of what they have and what they experience. And I believe that this is very largely responsible for the condition of the Christian church at this present time. People are so afraid of what they call enthusiasm, and some are so afraid of fanaticism. People are so afraid of excesses that in order to avoid those, they go right over to the other side, and they don't face what is offered in the New Testament. But they say the norm, the standard, is what they are and what they have. Now, to put to you clearly what I'm trying to say, let me put it like this. I hope to go into this in greater de detail on subsequent Sunday mornings. But let me put it just in a nutshell in this way. Compare, for instance, what you read about the life of the church at Corinth with the typical church life today. Ah, oh, but you say they were guilty of excesses in Corinth. I quite agree. But uh, how many churches do you know at the present time to which it is necessary to write such a letter as the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians? Uh, don't, don't put your emphasis entirely on the excesses. Paul corrects the excesses, but look what he allows. Look what he expects. Take your New Testament as it is. Look at the New Testament Christian, look at the New Testament church, and you will see it that vibrant with a spiritual life. And of course it is life always that tends to lead to excesses. There's no problem of discipline in a graveyard. There's no problem uh, very much in a formal church. The problems arise when there is life. A poor, sickly child isn't difficult to handle. But when the child is well and full of life and of vigor, well, then you have your problems. Problems are created by life and by vigor. And the problems of the early church were spiritual problems. Problems arising because of the danger to go to excess in the spiritual realm. Would anybody like to claim that that is the danger in the church speaking generally today? Well, it isn't, of course, and the reason for that is that we have been tending to interpret the New Testament teaching in the light of our own experiences. We assume that we've got everything. And therefore, the whole of this teaching is reduced to the level of what we have and what we are. Now then, there are the two great dangers. And as I'm trying to indicate, they're both wrong. And they're both equally wrong. The excesses, of course, and the fanaticism are most spectacular and they always attract attention. But the other is equally bad, if not more so. You see, there's all the difference in the world between a man in a state of delirium when he's ill and a man suffering from some terrible growth which is just eating out the vitals of his life and of his body and reducing him to a state of more or less of paralysis and of helplessness. But you see, the two things are equally bad. And therefore, we have to remember these two things. And so, I would lay down this fundamental proposition as we handle this whole matter. That everything must be tested by the teaching of the Scripture. 
We mustn't start with what we think, with what we like. Some of us would like the spectacular. Others are so dignified that dignity is the one thing that matters. Everything must be ordered and dignified and orderly, working like a clock with all the mechanism and mechanistic characteristics of a clock or of a machine. So if we start with ourselves and our, what we like and our experience, we'll already go wrong. No, no. We've got to start, all of us, with the New Testament and its teaching. Well, fortunately for us, there is plenty of it. We've already been looking at the teaching of John the Baptist, and we've also looked at those two most interesting incidents which are recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles at the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of chapter 19, the case of Apollos and the case of those disciples whom the Apostle Paul found at Ephesus. And what we've discovered hitherto is this, that there are obviously grades, steps, stages in the Christian life. The New Testament is full of that. Babes in Christ young men, old men, growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, and so on. But not only that. We have found that this is more than supported and fulfilled and substantiated in the subsequent history of men in the long story of the Christian church. And we see, especially in those two instances there that I've referred to, that what really makes the difference is this baptism of the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit or this receiving of the Spirit. Very well. Now then let me try to put this teaching of the New Testament as I understand it in the form of a number of principles. We've got to do this because John tells us there at the beginning of his gospel that the thing that is going to differentiate the new era from the old, even including John the Baptist, is this baptism with the Spirit. Very well. What are the principles? Well, here's the first. It is possible for us to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ without having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now then, there's my proposition. But let me clarify this, because it's often misunderstood. And this is, to me, the crux of the whole interpretation of the New Testament at this point. This is the key point, it seems to me. Don't you start thinking about phenomena. I may come to that in three or four Sundays. I don't know. But don't start with that. That's the fatal mistake that people make. They start with phenomena and they've got their prejudices and they take up their lines and points. And the New Testament teaching is entirely forgotten. No, no. Start with the teaching of the Scripture. In need of clarification, I say. Well, how? Well, like this. It is obvious that no man can be a Christian at all apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. That's obvious. The natural men, the natural mind, we are told is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The Apostle Paul, whom I've just quoted in Romans 8, 7, in that whole passage draws his great distinction between the natural men and the spiritual men. And that is the great difference. The spiritual man is a man, he says, who is led by the Spirit and walks after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Very well. You see, therefore, basically, you've got to start by saying no man can be a Christian at all without the Holy Spirit. The natural mind, enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And again, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, he puts it again in this way. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Again, in that chapter, the apostle is drawing a distinction between the Christian and the non-Christian. He says, even the princes of this world, though they are great men in great positions and men of great ability, they are not Christians. Why? Well, they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Had they known him, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But how do we believe? How does anybody believe in him? Well, he says, God hath revealed these things unto us by his Spirit. 
The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And again he says, We have received not the Spirit that is of the world, but the Spirit that is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He says, We are Christians because the Holy Spirit has worked in us and has given us this enlightenment and knowledge and understanding, this ability to believe. A man cannot believe without the work of the Holy Spirit. In every believer, the Holy Spirit is of necessity a resident. That's a fundamental statement of the whole of the Scripture. It is the Spirit who convicts us and who gives us the enlightenment and the ability to believe. No man by nature can believe the gospel. This is fundamental right through the whole Bible. But then we can go further. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates us. It is he who gives us new life. The Christian is a man who is born again. Yes, he's a man who is born of the Spirit. Now, in the Gospel of John, as we shall find, there is great teaching about this. You get it at once in our Lord's teaching to Nicodemus of all men. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's it. This is something that happens by, as the result of the operation of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is a secret work of the Spirit. It isn't something experimental. That is a secret work, and a man only knows that it's happened to him. But we've got a very specific statement in the ninth verse of the eighth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans, which puts this matter quite tersely once and forever. He says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So that clearly, any man who is a Christian is a man in whom the Holy Spirit of God dwells. I take it that that is therefore abundantly clear to all of us. You can't be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit in you. But, and here's the point, I am asserting at the same time that you can be a believer, that you can have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and still you have not been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, this is the crucial issue. Why do I say this? Well, let me give you my reasons. All I've been describing is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The work of convicting, the work of enlightening, the work of regenerating, and so on. That is what the Holy Spirit does in us. But, as you notice in this teaching, which we have there at the beginning in the first chapter of John's Gospel and which we saw so clearly in the preaching of John the Baptist. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is something that is done by the Lord Jesus Christ, not by the Holy Spirit. I indeed baptize you with water. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. This is not primarily some work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Lord Jesus Christ's act. It is his action. What he does to us through the Spirit, or his giving to us in this particular way of the Holy Spirit. Now, here it, it seems to me is something that uh, is there, plain and clear, on the very surface of this whole matter. And yet, people get confused over this. They quote 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we've all been baptized by one Spirit. Of course we have. Our being baptized into the body of Christ is the work of the Spirit, as regeneration is his work. But this is something entirely different. This is Christ baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. And I am suggesting that this is something which is therefore obviously distinct from and separate from becoming a Christian, being regenerate, having the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. I am putting it like this, that you can be a child of God and yet not baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now then, let me give you some proof. I start with the Old Testament saints. 
The Old Testament saints were as much the children of God as you and I are. Abraham is the father of the faithful. Abraham was a child of God. Now, I could give you endless scriptures to prove that. Our Lord himself says that you shall sit in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet some of these Jews are going to be outside, though they kept on boasting that Abraham was their father. But that's what it means to be in the kingdom of God, to be with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul in the third chapter of Galatians at great length shows that all the children of faith are children of Abraham. He is the father of the faithful. Indeed, the apostle Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, goes out of his way to emphasize this great thing, that when the Gentiles became Christians, what happened to them was that they became fellow citizens with the saints. That's to say the saints of the Old Testament and joint heirs with the saints of the Old Testament. You remember that great contrast in the second chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. He puts it like this in verses 11 and so on. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, which are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. That's where they were. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, all these men of the Old Testament, they all belong to the household of God. And when we become Christians as Gentiles, we become fellow citizens with them and members of the household of God. And then, to make this thing abundantly clear, the apostle repeats it in the third chapter of Ephesians. He says that the revelation had been made known to him of the mystery. What is it? Well, here it is. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. Very well. If you think that the Old Testament saints were not children of God, you're denying the whole of the scripture. They were. But they had not been baptized with the Holy Ghost. They were children of God. But they were not baptized with the Holy Ghost. Abraham believed in Christ, our Lord says. Abraham saw my day. He saw it afar off and he rejoiced. These men didn't understand it fully. But what made them children of God and men of faith was this, that they believed God's testimony about this coming one. No man can be saved except in Christ. There's only one way of salvation, Old Testament and new. It's always in Christ and by him crucified. Very well, there are your Old Testament saints. But come along, what about John the Baptist himself? Our Lord makes this quite clear. He says that no greater than John has ever arisen amongst the sons of women. I say unto you, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, he says. Amongst the sons of women, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now then, and yet John was not baptized with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist is a son of God. He's a child of God. Nevertheless, says our Lord, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's a reference to the kingdom of heaven taking the form of the church. That though John the Baptist is the last of the prophets, though he's a child of God and a unique servant of God, though the man is as saved as any Christian, he isn't enjoying the benefits which those who have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost which Christ is to give are able to enjoy. So John the Baptist is a believer, he's a child of God, but he was not baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then you remember that most important statement in the seventh chapter of John's Gospel. Let me read it to you in verses 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, 
If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet, the authorized version adds given quite rightly, was not yet given, was not yet, had not come in that way yet. The Holy Spirit always was, of course, you read about him in the Old Testament. He wasn't given in this way yet. He was given like that on the day of Pentecost, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, there again is one of these crucial statements. But let's go on and add to that. All this, it seems to me, becomes much clearer when you come right on to the book of the Acts of the Apostles and look at the case of the Apostles themselves. Now, surely, it is quite obvious that the Apostles were regenerate and were children of God before the day of Pentecost. Our Lord has already said, Now are ye clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. In the great high priestly prayer in the 17th chapter of John, he keeps on drawing a distinction between them and the world. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And throughout the whole of that 17th chapter, in the record of the high priestly prayer, the whole emphasis is that these people are already regenerate. Our Lord keeps on saying that. He says, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Nothing could be clear. These men are believers, these men are Christians. And then you remember we are told that after the resurrection, our Lord met with them in an upper room, and he breathed upon them. He breathed upon them the Holy Ghost. You remember that incident. It's recorded there in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. These men are not only believers, they're regenerate men, The Holy Spirit has been breathed upon them and they've received him in that way. But they still have not been baptized with the Holy Ghost. John Acts 1 verses, well, let me take you back to get this thing perfectly clear. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, here it is again. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power, but... You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And as you remember, the self-same men, already believers and regenerate, already having received the Holy Spirit in one sense, were baptized with the Holy Ghost. This is my way of substantiating that a man can be a true believer on the Lord Jesus Christ and a child of God and still not baptized with the Holy Ghost. But come, let's go on to the evidence which uh, we have already seen uh, this morning in the 8th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles where it is perhaps still more clearly put before us. Philip, you remember, went down from Jerusalem to Samaria, 
to preach the gospel to those Samaritans. And we are told this. The people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And there was great joy in that city. Then you've got this incident about this man, Simon. But concentrate on these others. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Now this is not the teaching of John the Baptist. This is the teaching of Philip, filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost. The plain Christian teaching, they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and and women. Now then, here they are. You see, they're believers. And they're rejoicing in their belief. They have been baptized, not with John's baptism, but they have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But then, verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Then in brackets, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. These people were already true believers on the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified as their Savior. They'd been baptized into his name because they'd become believers, but still they are not baptized with the Holy Ghost. I am just suggesting that you can be a true believer, a true Christian, born again, a child of God, and still may not have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The next case is none other than the case of the Apostle Paul himself. Now I'm spending this morning by just taking you through the scriptures. We shall be drawing lessons and working out this in detail, God willing, on subsequent Sunday mornings. But it's so vital we should start with the scriptures, my friends, not with our prejudices, not what we think, not what we are afraid of. Ah, they say now, you're opening the door wide to tongues. I'm sure many are already thinking that. You wait a minute. I shall deal with the question of gifts when it comes at the right place. You don't start with that. That comes towards the end of this treatment. But that's, you see, how the devil gets us to bypass the scriptures. In the interests of our particular point of view, whichever of the two extremes it may chance to be. Well, look at the case of Paul himself. You get that in the ninth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. There on the road to Damascus he sees the risen Lord and says, What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? He becomes as helpless as a little child. Undoubtedly, the apostle at that point believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw it. He was given the vision that enabled him to see it. But this is what I read in verses 17 and 18. A man called Ananias was uh, called by the Lord. The Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Paul was rendered blind, you remember. Well, then you go on. The Lord said unto Ananias, who didn't seem to want to go, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He doesn't instruct him on the way of salvation. But he sent to heal him and to fill him with the Holy Ghost. To give him the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. You, can, you see, you receive the Holy Ghost before you're baptized, or the other way around. It doesn't matter at all. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days 
with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Very well, there is another striking example of the same thing. I come to my last example from the book of the Acts of the Apostles this morning. I am not going to use the case of Apollos. I believe it could be used quite easily. It seems to me this is the only adequate explanation of the case of Apollos. This was the thing that Priscilla and Aquila recognized as lacking in Apollos and of which they told him, and it made all the difference to him. But leaving that out of account, come to the 19th chapter at the beginning. And you read, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, and you remember we've seen the full connotation of that. It always means believers in the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Acts, without a single exception. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? All right, I know what you want to say, and you're quite right. You say you're reading from the authorized version. I am. You say that's not the right translation. I agree. So let me give it to you in the Revised and the other translations. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Right, that's the correct translation. And of course it shows that the old authorized translation is after all not wrong. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? The implication there obviously is of course that you can believe without receiving the Holy Ghost that it's happen it happens to you afterwards. But, all right, you say, the other's the correct translation. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? But what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that it's obvious that you can believe without receiving the Holy Ghost. Let me use an illustration which I think I've used before. You may say to me, I had a cold last week. Then I put to you this one question. Did you run a temperature when you had your cold last week? What does that question mean? Well, it obviously means this, that you may have a cold without running a temperature. On the other hand, you may run a temperature when you have a cold. I want to know, did you or didn't you? And that's the very question that was put here by the Apostle. It is possible for a man to be baptized with the Holy Ghost virtually simultaneously with his belief. Take the case now of Cornelius and his household. You remember that there we are told in the 10th chapter of this book of Acts that as Peter was still speaking, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. There, it seems that the baptism with the Holy Spirit happened as they were believing, almost simultaneously. But it is clear from the question put by the Apostle that that is not always the case. That it is possible for a man to believe without receiving the Holy Ghost. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Paul obviously saw there was something wrong with these people. There was a defect. So he puts his question. He was quite clearly of the opinion himself that they had not been baptized with the Holy Ghost. So he puts it in the form of a question. When you believed, were you baptized with the Holy Ghost? So that you see even the revised translation and the others come to exactly the same thing in the end as the old authorized translation, except that these others are more accurate. From the purely linguistic standpoint, the authorized translation is wrong. But as so often, these authorized translators, they get the right point, the right meaning. They overemphasize it a little bit, as if it is always something subsequent. But what is established beyond any doubt is that one can be a believer without being baptized by the Holy Ghost. But if that doesn't satisfy you, and it should, listen to this. Paul addresses these men and he gives them further instruction. So I read in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The apostles perfectly happy about these men, that they're true believers. They've had John's baptism only. He says, but you must be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he baptized them now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're true believers, children of God, but still they have not been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Because I read this in verse 6. 
when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now there is an absolute proof that you can be a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and still not be baptized with the Holy Ghost. That case proves it twice over. Twice over. The question at the beginning, what actually happened subsequently. This interval, this differentiation. The time element is not the important one. The important point is that there is a difference, that there is a distinction between believing and being baptized with the Holy Ghost. So I give you my last bit of evidence, which is in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in the first chapter and the 13th verse. And with this we close. Paul now is reminding these Gentile Christians of how they became Christians. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, and to the praise of his glory. All right, you say again, authorized translation once more, and again they've made exactly the same mistake. In whom also, after that he believed, shouldn't be that. What should it be? Well, as the revised has got it, in whom also believing, he were baptized with the Holy Ghost. But you see, once more, it doesn't make any difference to the meaning and to the truth. It is only the believer who is baptized with the Holy Ghost or who receives the seal of the Spirit. In whom believing he were baptized. It's the same order again. The believing is the first thing. The being baptized is something that doesn't of necessity happen at the same time. It may, it may not, but it is distinct and separate, so the apostle does separate them. In whom, believing, you were also sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Very well then. That's our first great principle. I'm afraid we've got to leave it at that this morning. All I am trying to establish is this that the teaching which tells us that every man at his regeneration is baptized of necessity with the Holy Ghost is a contradiction of the plain teaching of the Scripture. You can be regenerate without being baptized with the Holy Ghost. And the Scriptures that I've adduced to you show quite plainly and clearly that to say, as so many have said in this century, and so many are still saying, that every man at regeneration is baptized with the Holy Ghost, is simply to fly in the face of this plain, explicit teaching of the Holy Scriptures. God willing, as I say, we shall go on with this all-important subject next Sunday morning. Now let us sing our closing hymn, which is hymn number 206. 206. Come, Holy Spirit, come, let thy bright beams arise. Dispel the darkness from our minds and open all our eyes. 206.
to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this hour short and certain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall be in the glory everlasting. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust dot o-r-g. The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the first chapter, reading verses 26 and 33. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you whom ye know not, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Now, most of you will realize that I take these two verses and put them together because of this great truth which they bring out, namely that John the Baptist was constantly telling the people that he was not the Christ and that the essential difference between them was that he, John, baptized with water, whereas the Christ would baptize with the Holy Ghost. Now, why are we looking at this? Well, we're doing so because, as we've been seeing at great length, the truth about the Christian should be this, the statement in the 16th verse of this first chapter of John's Gospel, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for or upon grace. That is what the Christian is meant to be like. He is a man who has received something of the fullness of Christ, and he goes on receiving it increasingly. That is the Christian life. That is what it means to be a Christian. And I'm suggesting that uh, immediately uh, John the Evangelist uh, shows us the way in which this can become true of us and increasingly true of us. And that is that we receive of his fullness in large and great measure when we are truly baptized with the Holy Ghost by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, In order to bring this out, we've been showing something of this contrast that John the Baptist himself drew so clearly in his ministry. We dealt with the best exposition of that as it's to be found in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke in the first 17 verses. And there we saw some of these striking contrasts between John's baptism and our Lord's baptism, putting it very roughly, the difference between religion and Christianity, or indeed we can go further. The difference between being content with the beginnings, or what the author of the epistle to the Hebrews calls the first principles only of the doctrine of Christ, and this same doctrine in greater fullness. Now, we are doing this, and I must go on repeating this because this is no academic exercise. I'm not doing this because of all the interest that is being manifested on all hands at the present time in this question of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the occasional gifts that may accompany it. But uh, I'm doing something that uh, we've been doing for over two years, 
We've spent two years in considering the prologue of John's Gospel because, as I've been trying to show, it seems to me that this is the thing we need above everything else at this present time. We need it as individual Christians, but we need it still more because of the state of the world that is round and about us. If we have no sense of responsibility for the condition of humanity at this moment, well then, there's only one thing to say. If we are Christians at all, we are very poor Christians. If we are only concerned about ourselves and our own happiness, and if the moral condition of society and the tragedy of the whole world doesn't grieve us, if we are not disturbed at the way in which men blaspheme the name of God, and all the arrogance of sin. Well, what can be said about us? But I'm assuming that we are concerned, that we are concerned ourselves, that we may receive what God has intended us to receive in his Son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And if we are not receiving what he's made possible, well, it is an insult to God. So these two aspects must be borne in mind. Our own individual states and needs, but still more, I say, the condition of the world as it is around and about us. Now then, that's what we are doing, and I'm trying to show that uh, the great danger constantly is that we should be content with something which is altogether less intended for us. Now let me put it like this. Perhaps the greatest danger of all for Christian people always is to interpret the scriptures in the light of our own experiences instead of doing it the other way around. We shouldn't interpret scripture in the light of our experiences, but we should examine our experiences in the light of the teaching of the scripture. Now this is a fundamental and basic point. It's particularly important, I feel, just at this moment in view of the things that are happening in the Christian church and the talk that is round and about us. Now, there are two main ways in which it seems to me we can go wrong in this question of the relationship of our experiences to the teaching of the Scripture. The first danger is the danger of claiming things which either go beyond the Scripture or which indeed may even be contrary to the scripture. Uh, there are many who have done that throughout the centuries, and there are people who are still doing it. There have been people, you had them in the early church, they were claiming that they were uniquely inspired. The apostle calls them false apostles. There were people who claimed that they were receiving revelation, and they didn't care what the teaching was, they said they'd got this directly from God. Now, as I say, throughout the centuries, there have been people who, claiming to be ultra-spiritual, have gone beyond the scriptures. I remember once hearing a man saying he didn't care what the Apostle Paul or anybody else said. He knew. He'd had an experience. Now, the moment a man says that, he's putting his own experience above the scriptures. That opens the door to fanaticism. Not enthusiasm, but fanaticism and other horrible possible uh, dangers. So there is one danger that uh, we put uh, what we experience subjectively over the scripture and uh, put it superior to the scripture. Now, another way in which this is done, of course, is uh, to put tradition or the teaching of the church above scripture. That's the Roman Catholic heresy, uh, to say that tradition is coordinate with the scripture. And that means in the end that tradition is superior to the scripture. You see, there's nothing in the scripture about the so-called assumption of the Virgin Mary, that she never died but and was buried, but literally rose in the body into heaven. Not a word about it in the scripture, but they teach it. And uh, it is their authority that, that alone sanctions such a teaching. Not a word to suggest that anywhere in the scripture. That's the kind of thing I mean. But uh, forgetting uh, something as obvious as the Roman Catholic heresy, there are many, I say, who are always prone, and they're generally the most spiritually minded people, 
to become so interested in the experimental side that they become indifferent to the scripture. Now, the Quakers, the early Quakers, were particularly subject to this, with their emphasis on the inner light. They again did say that uh, whatever the scripture may say, they knew it had been revealed to them directly. One of them, poor men, claimed that he was the incarnate Christ again, and rode into the city of Bristol on a horse, with many misguided people following him, believing his teaching, because he spoke it with authority. Now, that's fanaticism. And it is a terrible, a horrible danger, which we must always bear in mind. But that's how it arises. It's this divorce between the scripture and experience. And it is putting experience above the scripture in the sense that we claim things that are not sanctioned by the scripture, perhaps even prohibited by the scripture. But there is a second danger. And it's equally important that we should bear it in mind. Because the second is the exact opposite of the first. And these things, as I'm never tired of reminding you, generally go from one violent extreme to the other. How difficult it is to maintain a balance always. The second danger then is this. Is the danger of being satisfied with something very much less than that which is offered in the scripture. And the danger of interpreting scripture by our experiences and reducing the teaching of the scripture to the level of what we know and experience. And I would say that this second is the greater danger of the two at the present time. In other words, uh, people by nature, certain people by nature, are afraid of the supernatural. They're afraid of the unusual. They're afraid of disorder. And you know, you can be so afraid of disorder, you can be so concerned about discipline and decorum and control that you become guilty of what the scriptures call quenching the spirit. And there is no question in my mind but that there has been a great deal of this. People come to the New Testament, instead of taking the New Testament teaching as it is, they interpret the New Testament in the light of their experiences. And so they reduce it. They minimize the great statements of the New Testament. Everything is interpreted in terms of what they have and what they experience. And I believe that this is very largely responsible for the condition of the Christian church at this present time. People are so afraid of what they call enthusiasm. And some are so afraid of fanaticism. People are so afraid of excesses that in order to avoid those, they go right over to the other side, and they don't face what is offered in the New Testament. But they say the norm, the standard, is what they are and what they have. Now, to put to you clearly what I'm trying to say, let me put it like this. I hope to go into this in greater de detail on subsequent Sunday mornings. But let me put it just in a nutshell in this way. Compare, for instance, what you read about the life of the church at Corinth with the typical church life today. Ah, oh, but you say they were guilty of excesses in Corinth. I quite agree. But uh, how many churches do you know at the present time to which it is necessary to write such a letter as the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians? Uh, don't, don't put your emphasis entirely on the excesses. Paul corrects the excesses, but look what he allows. Look what he expects. Take your New Testament as it is. Look at the New Testament Christian. Look at the New Testament church. And you will see it that vibrant with a spiritual life. And of course it is life always that tends to lead to excesses. There's no problem of discipline in a graveyard. There's no problem uh, very much in a formal church. The problems arise when there is life. A poor sickly child isn't difficult to handle. But when the child is well and full of life and of vigor, well then you have your problems. Problems are created by life and by vigor. And the problems of the early church were spiritual problems. Problems arising because of the danger to go to excess in the spiritual realm. 
Would anybody like to claim that that is the danger in the church speaking generally today? Well, it isn't, of course, and the reason for that is that we have been tending to interpret the New Testament teaching in the light of our own experiences. We assume that we've got everything. And therefore, the whole of this teaching is reduced to the level of what we have and what we are. Now then, there are the two great dangers. And as I'm trying to indicate, they're both wrong. And they're both equally wrong. The excesses, of course, and the fanaticism are most spectacular and they always attract attention. But the other is equally bad, if not more so. You see, there's all the difference in the world between a man in a state of delirium when he's ill and a man suffering from some terrible growth which is just eating out the vitals of his life and of his body and reducing him to a state of more or less of paralysis and of helplessness. But you see, the two things are equally bad. And therefore, we have to remember these two things. And so, I would lay down this fundamental proposition as we handle this whole matter that everything must be tested by the teaching of the scripture. We mustn't start with what we think with what we like. Some of us would like the spectacular. Others are so dignified that dignity is the one thing that matters. Everything must be ordered and dignified and orderly, working like a clock with all the mechanism and mechanistic characteristics of a clock or of a machine. So if we start with ourselves and what we like and our experience, we'll already go wrong. No, no. We've got to start, all of us, with the New Testament and its teaching. Well, fortunately for us, there is plenty of it. We've already been looking at the teaching of John the Baptist. And we've also looked at those two most interesting incidents which are recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles at the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of chapter 19, the case of Apollos and the case of those disciples whom the Apostle Paul found at Ephesus. And what we've discovered hitherto is this, that there are obviously grades, steps, stages in the Christian life. The New Testament is full of that. Babes in Christ, young men, old men growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, and so on. But not only that. We have found that this is more than supported and fulfilled and substantiated in the subsequent history of men in the long story of the Christian church. And we see, especially in those two instances there that I've referred to, that what really makes the difference is this baptism of the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit or this receiving of the Spirit. Very well. Now then, let me try to put this teaching of the New Testament as I understand it in the form of a number of principles. We've got to do this because John tells us there at the beginning of his gospel that the thing that is going to differentiate the new era from the old, even including John the Baptist, is this 